But the venues we chose on this uh, 20th anniversary thing, we had uh, six shows and uh, we wanted them to be s special, I guess, you know, and, and uh, the benchmark was the Albert Hall because that, that was one of the first shows that we got booked. So every, every other, uh, the other shows we tried to, to base, try to find a venue similar to that, you know, which is impossible to be honest, but uh, we did find a, a, a few nice places. But we wanted them to have some history, like the one we played uh, in Germany, in Essen, is one of the oldest cinemas they have, if not the oldest. Uh, Circus in Stockholm is a, is a really cozy, nice place, similar to the Albert Hall, but much smaller, you know. But generally we just wanted them to be fairly big, so we could put a lot of people in there. Because we only had six shows, we were thinking people were going to travel to see this, which I think they did, you know. But the original plan for, for this uh, 20th anniversary was not a tour. It was like, a, 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 you know, hanging out in a pub in Stockholm, you know, just having a few drinks with your friends because we never celebrated anything. We never had a release party, never had an anniversary party or anything. So. Uh, we're planning to do something, just gather up some friends, have a few drinks, maybe we'll play a song or two. And it kind of escalated into some of the biggest shows we've ever done. Well, when we played the Royal Albert Hall, there was a lot of things going through my head. Uh, during the show, I didn't really think about Deep Purple and Camel and all those bands that I love that played there, you know. It was just like I had tried to take it all in. You know, you look up and it seemed so massive to me, you know. It was unreal. I remember I was just playing and I was like, wow, it's just crazy. Uh, but before, you know, once we landed, once the show was confirmed, I got a bit nervous, you know. You want to make it, you know, just want to make it so memorable that it's, uh, I don't know, you're afraid to, to kind of, Fuck it all up, if you know what I mean. You know, you want it to be great. But it was, it was the, the, one of the greatest shows I think we ever done. Maybe not playing wise, but it was, it was amazing. Nothing short of amazing. Well, the fans, they mean a lot to us, of course, we, we depend on them, you know, that's just how it is, you know. Uh, so, uh, we always take our time with them, you know. The meet and greets that we did on the 20th anniversary show, I think was a very, at first I was like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm into the idea because it feels a bit constructed. But uh, we agreed on it and it was, I think it was, it was great actually. Because uh, we got to spend a lot more time with them than if we did a regular signing session, because that just feels like a, a, a factory thing. You barely look up. People are just in line and just signing, yeah, there you go, you go, fuck off, you know, you, you barely see him, you know. I just met him outside uh, just before the show and we chatted a bit and he's a really good guy. I mean, I've, I've met him several times at other shows as well and uh, really loves the fans. But this was a, a little bit of a thing. We, we kind of spread out in the room where we, we were at and just let them come up to us ask us something and hang out, take the pictures and sign the, sign the stuff and everything. And I, I think it went down really good, really well. You know, people seemed to really enjoy it, you know, and they were thanking us. And I thought it was a bit special, actually. Much better than I expected, much better. Well, it's important to have a type of, like a family feeling uh, on tour with the people you work with. For us in the band, it's kind of easy because we're, we're, we're mates anyways, you know, we, we hang out. They're the only friends I got left, <laughs> pretty much, you know. Uh, so we get along great, you know. I think we're all a bit normal in a way and a bit strange. You have to be a bit odd in order to do this, I think. Mendes. Uh, Martin Mendes, the bass player, has been in the band now since 98. That's a 12, 13 years or something like that. 
and he's uh, he's uh, uh, a rock, you know, he's a mountain, you know. I feel like he's my my right hand in a way. But he wasn't always like that. He used to be a complete pain in the ass, you know. <laughs> um, he didn't say much, but he was just you know so it, it wasn't together at all. It was just like all over the place. <laughs> um, but now he's. Uh, Especially, I think, since he became a dad, since he had his son, he just shaped up and he's, uh, he's really on, on top of things, you know. I trust him with my life, to be honest. So he's a really good guy and everybody likes him, you know. Uh, Axe, a drummer, is a uh, really nice, really nice guy, you know, good friend of mine and fantastic drummer. But he has, uh, <laughs> I don't know, he's, he's, uh, he's got some type of... Uh, ADHD or something like that. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with his personality, but it did flood four, sh four floors in a posh Manhattan hotel uh, because it turned all the taps on and just went to bed. And it's not the first time he done stuff like that. When I called him up to offer him the job in the band, he said, can I call you back because the house, the, the, the flat is on fire. So he's, uh, yeah, he's, uh, you know, I love all of them to death, you know, but it's like sometimes they're just impossible to deal with, you know. Paris is probably the most normal, normal one, together with me, I would have to say. Uh, he's uh, genuine, very honest, you know, and uh, he's, he's, an, he's probably the least pretentious guy I ever met in my life, you know. He's from this part of Sweden where everybody's just like, <clears throat> they might be the best in the world at what they do, but they're like, oh, you know, it's nothing, whatever, you know. Uh, but he's really trustworthy. He can be a bit moody sometimes. He looks moody sometimes. Like, and Frederick is the new guy. He's the latest addition, uh, and he's he also got a very big uh, heart. You know, very friendly guy, and you instantly like him. I think. Uh, he's, uh, I don't think he has lots of hidden agendas. He loves to play guitar and drink beer, you know, and he loves metal, you know. So I think he's, he's a pretty simple guy, you know, in that sense. You know, all of us are, I guess, but he's really, uh, you get to know him like that, you know. And, you, and uh, he's also very trustworthy, I think. Loves food. He can talk about the next meal when he's eating. You know, he's stuffing his face with pies and he's like, what are we going to have at seven o'clock, you know? You're like, how can you talk about that now, you know, we're eating. <laughs> and nothing's really intentional when it comes to the music other than uh, we try to just have an open mind, you know. we. The five of us have such a diverse range of influences, it's, it's spooky, almost. I personally listen to all styles of music, and what makes Opeth, I think, is, is the, the mix of, of music genres, you know. I don't think we have a particularly bluesy part, to be honest, you know. But there's, like, in the guitar solos, maybe might be some blues things thrown in there, whatever. But it's never been intentional. It's never been like, oh, we have to widen our sound, let's bring in some reggae, you know. It just comes down to whatever comes out of my head when I write and whatever comes out of the other guy's head when they write. As I said, with the, with the different range of inf influence that we do have, it's, it's impossible for us to just be metal, you know. I would hate it, to be honest. I think uh, what makes us write good metal music is that we listen to non-metal music is more likely we come up with a fantastic metal song listening to a Marvin Gaye album, you know. People think, ah, you're just saying that, but I would never be able to write a metal song listening to um, Power Slave, Fire Maiden, even though it's a great album, but those classic metal albums I got with me, they're in my blood, they're just, they kind of find their way into our music anyways. It's just to come up with something unique, I think you need unique influences. get fed up with myself and 
the music scene and the band all the time, pretty much. But uh, I've done it for such a long time, and I'm, I'm 36 now, so I don't know what else to do. And I know I love it, you know. I can hate it sometimes, but <clears throat> when I come back home off tour for the first couple of days, you're like, oh my God, that's so nice. Hang out with my kids and, and my wife and my cats and go out wash the car and listen to my records and stuff. And it's lovely, but soon enough you start itching, you know. And uh, it's the same with everyone I know who's in the same business. Everybody hates it when they're out doing it and they love it when they can't, when they're, when they're back home, they're just like, can't wait to get out again, you know. So it's in your blood, you know, it's like a disease. I uh, had a few kind of, uh, during my downs, so to speak, thinking like maybe I should just do something else. You know, work in a grocery store, you know. I could, I could have a different job, I think. I would be a fairly good employee, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, this is my uh, calling, so to speak. I don't see any reason why I should stop now because I, I still love music too much. And I still love, without sound, trying to sound like a complete idiot, I love my own music too. Time. can't really choose to be a musician, you know, unless you succeed, sooner or later you're going to have to pay the bills. But it's, it's a big risk for me, it was, you know, it was a risk. I had a job at a guitar store and I loved it, you know, I loved working in, a, in, in that store, repairing guitars and stuff like that. But it got to a point where, uh, firstly I wasn't really getting along that well with my boss and I wanted a race or whatever which I didn't get. And uh, uh, the band was taking up more and more time, but I wasn't making a penny, nothing. I had nothing in my pocket, I was completely broke. I don't even know how I su survived, to be honest, in those days, but I guess I borrowed money from something. Mama, mama. <laughs> but we, had, we, we got signed pretty early on, you know, and I, I felt I had my foot in somehow, you know. I was just waiting for something to happen and, you know, I, I would still have been a musician somehow, even if I wasn't a working musician or professional musician, but uh, one day we just found ourselves in a situation where it's impossible for us to have a regular job because we're touring all the time, besides we're earning, you know. Um, and we got our shit together a little bit once we, in, uh, around the time of the Blackwater Park album, when we toured for that, we signed with our management, who sorted us out in a way, because prior to then we were just clueless bums, you know. And we to some extent I think we still are, but we have, the organization just built up, you know, if you know what I mean. And now, uh, ever since, 2000 at Blackwater Park, around that time, we, we just became more and more professional. And things started going really well for us. And that's when we started living off of the, the band, pretty much all of us. But prior to that, we didn't have anything, nothing. We were screwed, you know. <laughs> it's pressure from society, from, from your parents and friends who, who are just advancing with their educations and their jobs and everything, and you're st sitting with a guitar that you borrowed from somebody because you can't afford to buy it. You don't have an amp. You don't have anywhere to live. You can barely buy f food. But you got this great riff, you know. I decided I'd just, uh, I didn't want to die thinking about that could have been, you know. I wanted to take it to the limit. And then with time, things got better. And now I'm kind of lost in it in a way, you know. I don't know, this is my reality. This is my job. So I don't know anything else then, you know. I 
I think a lot of uh, people are probably great singers, but uh, what keeps them back is what's in their heads, if you know what I mean. For me, that, it was that way, confidence, you know. Uh, I never taken lessons or anything, and I still, you know, I'm, I, I, for me, when people say that I have a wide vocal range or that I'm a great singer, I'm their favorite, favorite singer, I feel it just, whatever. I can't really take it in because I don't feel it's, it's like that, if you know what I mean. I don't think I'm a particularly good singer. Um, I'm just a singer in my band, if you know what I mean. I wouldn't fit in fucking Supremes. <laughs> um, but uh, I, th I think the clean vocals is something I, I care a little bit more about these days because I'm, I, st I feel I'm learning all the time. <laughs> You know, uh, with the screams, I'm more or less uh, uh, can't take it any further. Sorry. Do we look like we take requests? Close the door. Idiot. People think I'm, I would be a stand-up comedian. I got that a lot, actually. But I don't think I'm, I'm funny, you know. Michael's really funny on stage as well. Yeah. So he's, it's, where he's, it's a stand-up and a show, so you get everything. And also because I'm Swedish and I'm, I'm not talking my, in my native tongue most of the shows we do, you know. Uh, I can say anything and people think it's funny, you know. He, he always talks between the songs and says sort of nice things that you wouldn't imagine that he would say about his family and stuff. So I don't think I have a particular sense of humour that's that would allow me to go on this separate career as a stand-up comedian. It would be embarrassing. It would be like, you know, no laughs, you know, but I'm, I like humour, if you know what I mean, and dry humour. People say that I got dry humour, which I guess is, is fairly true, but I, I don't think I'm I'm funny. Most of the things I talk about are just, uh, <clears throat> you know, metal is funny. You can say there's a lot of fun things about metal, and it's been such a macho culture since it, since uh, since it started back in the day, and and uh, to some extent it it's, seems like a lot of these metal bands from the past they never made fun with their own uh, with their own bands or whatever with the scene. So it's not so common. But uh, for me, I just started talking one day. You know, we played a show and it's like, I said something and I got a reaction. I loved it, you know. Uh, before I used to, I barely spoke. I barely said thanks, you know, between the songs and really shy, I think. When he was talking personally about his life, that was really impressive. And he's so down-to-earth guy, you know. We love him. My kind of um, <clears throat> off-stage personality is on stage these days, in a way. I'm a bit more out there, I guess, but it's the same. I'm the same, I think, in many ways, when I go on stage. And it was uh, Devin Townsend, actually, who got me thinking about it a little bit. Because I spent a lot of time with him on a tour we did together. And Devin is... Uh, a good friend of mine, I guess, you know, and uh, I love him, and he's funny. That guy's funny. And he's doing things on stage, and it kind of rubbed off a little bit on me, you know. Not trying to steal his act or anything, because that's not what it's about, but I was like, yeah, why not? I can just say what, what the fuck I want, you know. I own that stage for that hour or whatever it is. So I just talk shit, and sometimes it's funny, but it also happens, you know, I play in, in uh, cities or countries or whatever that, where they don't speak English that well. And I say something which I think is hilarious. And there's just dead calm. Nobody, they're just looking at each other. It's like, this is not metal. Stephen Wilson, is, I wouldn't say he's intimidating, you know, in that sense, but the first time I met him, he was my idol. I've been listening to his music for a long time, ever since the Sky Moves Sideways album came out in 95 or something, 94 maybe. Uh, and I loved what he was doing. And the fact that he was uh, 
he was uh, basically taking care of, of everything. You know, he was producing, recording, writing, everything pretty much. <clears throat> so I was just, I was very impressed with him before I even met him, of course, and I loved his music. And um, when I asked him to work with us, he was, um, I was expecting him to say no, like he's beyond us or something, you know, but he was like, yeah, great. Uh, and we did this album, and of course I had a little bit of, uh, uh, felt a little bit st stressed. I wanted to impress him, you know, and I think he pretty much did, to be honest. And we we're on the uh, same wavelength, musically, in many ways. So I love him, you know, he's, he's a friend of mine and a mentor and uh, an idol. The first album may be a bit more special than, say, the, the third. The first one, I was 19, and uh, totally green, didn't know anything about anything. I was just ambitious, to say the least. And we had these monster songs, 15, 20 minute songs. And we're going to record, we recorded this uh, album, it's called Orchid at a studio in a small town called Finspong, which is where the producer lived at the time, Don Swan, who had a small studio called Gory Sound, death metal studio. And he was just doing small, minor, low-budget productions for small labels, and we were on a small label at the time, a label called Candlelight Records. And uh, <clears throat> well, we just did the album, and we'd never been, I'd never set foot in the studio before. It was all a, a completely new environment for me. I was just like, wow, we got microphones and cables and this is mixing console. It was like a 16 channel mixing console and quarter inch tapes, which nobody, I don't think at the time, nobody used quarter inch tapes. <laughs> and he was doing the, he mixed, I think he mixed it down onto a VHS, VHS cassette, like, uh, recording over some old porn flick or something, you know, and then brought it to for mastering, which apparently you could do with, with uh, what was it called, A-dots. In those days, it was 94. And uh, well, I was, you know, we recorded and mixed the album in 12 days, which uh, at the time I thought that's, that's like, it felt like a year. But looking back, I was like amazed that we could do it, you know. But we cut most of it, like the drums and some of the guitars were cut live and then just did everything really quick. And the mixing, because there was no, no digital things going on at the time, and there was this little 16-channel console. And to mix it, everybody needed to help out with the faders. We were crawling over each other like spiders, trying to reach our faders, and then on, on a cue, we're supposed to fade it down or fade it up or mute it or whatever. So everybody, I think all of us, helped out, like five guys just crawling over this console. Uh, so it was really, it was really funny. And I also celebrated my birthday. I missed one day of mixing because I had too much to drink. I ended up vomiting for a whole day and I mixed, uh, uh, I missed a, a mixing of a song. But overall that was just a very good, uh, very fun experience. And I think we learned a lot from that, you know. Becoming a dad uh, is another one of those things you don't, you know, you can't really plan for it, you know. You change in the very moment you see your son or your daughter, you know. Musically, it, I don't know if it had that much of an effect on me, to be honest. When I had my first uh, daughter, Melinda, when my wife was pregnant, just a, like a couple of months before we were, she was born, I was writing uh, for the Ghost Reveries album. And uh, it was just a very calm atmosphere, waiting for our child, you know. And I was writing these songs in the meantime, so that's what I remember. But it didn't really affect the way I was writing, to be honest. It affected me more in my private life, I think. And also in, in uh, uh, awareness of, of me and mortality. Before I could, you know, not that I had a death wish or anything, but I was like, you drop dead, yeah, whatever, you know, if it happens, you know, I wasn't 
afraid of it, if you know what I mean. But I am now. Don't, I want to be there for them, if you know what I mean. So I'm afraid. And I'm also just terrified if some, something's going to happen to them. So I think it, uh, uh, it affects you in both a negative and a positive way. You know, you get more aware of things that you just didn't give a fuck about before. I started giving money to charities and stuff, you know, like Bono. Uh, but also uh, in a negative way in that sense that you just think, you know, don't want people to come close to them, especially when they're infants, you know. You're in town with a trolley and some junkie comes up and you just want to push him down before the subway train. You know, it just feels like you're so afraid of everything. Something might happen to them or get sick or... Uh, and you're, I, I am overly protective of them. And I can't see how, how that ever going to change. Like, they're just kids now. You know, they're, they're going to turn six and, and three this year. Uh, but when they're like teenagers, I'm thinking about that stuff. I'm like, fuck, I buy a gun, you know. <laughs> I just paid 446 pounds for a record by a band called Andwella's Dream. It was shit. Didn't like it. First song was great. Rest was not good. That's the most expensive album I ever bought. That would not be it, I think. You know, it has to be something that because I collect rare records, you know. And some parts it's just, it's deceased and it's a bit weird and everything and it's uh, sometimes it has more to do with the the rarity factor than if it's good or not, you know, like Andrella's dream. Uh, so I have to say, uh, it's not a particularly rare record, but I'm a big fan of Nick Drake, and he only did three albums in the, in the from '69 to '72, and uh, all of them are great. But one of them, the second one, Brighter Lighter, is called, from 1970, is a rare record, a uh, fantastic record, and also the soundtrack to uh, both my kids. Both my kids were born to that record playing in the hospital. And I have a mint condition original copy on island of that very record. So I'll probably bring that one. But, I, you know, it's horrible. It feels like I'm, they're my kids, you know, like they're my other kids, all my records, you know, I care so much for them. It's, it feels like I almost want to cry thinking about if I can only bring one record of mine. Blackwater Park is, some people say it's a breakthrough record. It is, I guess. And, it's a popular record. People like that album. You know, I like it. We we all enjoy those songs, and we always play songs from from that record on our tour. And we also had it because it celebrated ten, ten years, Blackwater Park, and we had a reissue coming out on Sony. So it kind of made sense they were going to do it. You know, do that album. And it's also a bit uh, fashionable now, I think, in order to make some shows a bit more special. Whatever, you pull out some old album and play the whole thing through. But I like that, personally. I don't think there's any harm in doing that stuff, you know. And it is a good album. A very difficult question, I think, because uh, with my heroes, I would become totally passive if they would be around. And it would feel like a stupid idea to present a musical idea to some of them. Like they listen to what I have to say, if you know what I mean. But some people that I respect tremendously, of course, there's shitloads. <clears throat> but in terms of making it a successful thing, like something that would, would actually amount to some great music, I am thinking Scott Walker, because he's got a, a completely fucked up idea on his own music, what he wants to do, and. Since we're coming from such diverse backgrounds musically, I think we would get, all, get along. And his last album was basically more stark sounding than any metal album I ever heard in my life. 
I think we would really be able to do something cool together. But then there's people like Joni Mitchell, for instance, who I love everything she's done. But as a musician or as a singer and a songwriter, I, I would want to work with the late 60s Joni Mitchell, which is obviously not possible. But if I had my own pick, like if I could choose anyone, as you said, living or dead, you know, it would still be people that are alive. Both Scott Walker and Joni are alive and well, as far as I know. So uh, I'd have to say one of them. Not really, I continue writing. You get it out of your system, like the shit. You, you have to kind of go through seas of shit in order to uh, find something that you can use, you know. Uh, I, I do it all the time, you know, I sit in my studio just playing and I kind of know it's not good enough. But I try to work it to a limit where I just am absolutely positive it's horrible, if you know what I mean. Because you can, you can have a simple, horrible riff. It's like you don't think anything of it, you know, like a, two notes together. And it's like, yeah, that's nothing. But maybe the vocal line I come up with will just make those two chords sound great. So I want to try every, you know, t many different angles on the same idea, if you know what I mean. Uh, but sometimes when I get writer's block, I just like, go out, you know. It's quite scary sometimes, writer's block, because you, you feel like, oh, will I ever be able to write something again? But most of the time you, you just, it's a passion for me. So even if I'm not writing for a month on end, I know that sooner or later I'll just grab my cup of coffee, walk down there and write something that I think is amazing. if I would be approached by a filmmaker and if I liked the film, I would, yeah, I would love it, you know. I'd love to try it out. I would get myself into something I don't, I could, couldn't, wouldn't be able to, to control or handle. And I, it's also difficult for me in some sense to write music on order. If they want a particular vibe, you know, okay, this part has to feel like you're uh, scared or something or whatever. It might be difficult for me. I never really done that, to be honest. Uh, but I don't know what type of film. I, li I'm, uh, I see a lot of films myself. And I see everything from stupid comedies like Step Brothers, which I loved, to just really narrow stuff, you know. Uh, but my favorite genre would probably be like the whole... <clears throat> mobster thing, Scorsese things, like Goodfellas, shit like that. That's probably my feel. It's, it's so entertaining to me. Not sure if I could write music for a thing like that. It'd probably be like horror film. Horror film would probably work for me. I don't know, to be honest. Like the whole advice thing, I can't remember where I read it or if I saw it like in an interview, somebody said like, what advice would you give to an uh, aspiring musician? And the answer was, a real musician don't take advice, which I love, you know. Uh, and, and that's what I, people are becoming, asking me that all the time, like how are going to make it in the music business? So I usually drop giving that answer sometimes and feel really cool about myself, you know. But uh, really, like, with the, 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 there's not much to say, you know. For me, it, it's never been a question of uh, getting advices, you know. You just do it, you know. It's inside of you and you just get it out. I think everybody has their own, uh, uh, um, how they vent feelings or emotions or uh, uh, 
things like that, if you know what I mean. And some people just build uh, small airplane models or whatever. And people do different shit, you know. And they just start doing this for no apparent reason. And for me, that's how it was for, uh, you know, in terms of being a musician and writing lyrics. I always loved music. I always played records. I always been interested in music and especially metal music, I guess. So it was never a question. It's just I had a. It was inside of me since I was born. And sooner or later, I think it was inevitable I'm going to pick up a guitar and boom, and fall in love with it, if you know what I mean. So if it's not natural, I don't think it's for you. I can't see myself producing other bands, to be honest, because I simply don't think I would love it as much <laughs> as I do my, my own stuff, if you know what I mean. That's what makes me a good producer because I'm so into it for my own stuff, if you know what I mean. I'm really just obsessed with it in a way. But to just like uh, go into the studio every day and sit with a drummer and talk about a 4-4 and a drum fill and stuff like that is... I couldn't do that unless it was for my own project. No, not really. We still have a fairly basic setup in, in terms of what instruments we use for, for the band. It's guitars, bass, drums, vocals and keyboards. And I think there's still a lot we can do with those instruments. To some extent, bringing in new instruments might help you to develop new musical ideas, I guess. We did take it to, to another, another level on the last album because we invited some uh, pro like classical musicians, which I think worked perfectly for that album. But uh, not really missing anything. I don't think I would ask them anything. What could I ask? I don't know. I would just ask them if they want to ask me something, <laughs> I guess. Well, Opeth is uh, everything to me in a way, you know, like... F first, my family, if you do it like uh, one, two, three, it's my family, Opeth, record collector, collection, you know. Uh, it's my bread and butter in many ways, you know. It's, how, it's my job, it's my passion. It's how I kind of express myself. I think I can be really grumpy and uh, really difficult to deal with when I'm not being able to surround myself with everything that is Opeth, if you know what I mean. Sometimes it's a little bit too much work for me, but I depend on it, you know, to be right. It's like a safety net thing for me. For some reason, if whatever happens, blah, 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 I still have Opeth, if you know what I mean. It's like... Uh, it's, uh, it's probably bigger for me than I, than I would able, be able to comprehend. Uh, but, yeah, it's everything, you know. There's been many. Highs and lows, shit, shit loads of lows. Band members leaving, it's never fun. Uh, puts a lot of stress on, on me, the other guys in the band, and the, the name, our name basically. You know, people, we lose credibility with people leaving. Uh, but the biggest low for me was around 2002, 2003. We did a double album thing, Deliverance and Damnation. It was a horrible recording to the point where uh, uh, I just felt that's it, you know, I got sick. Nothing was funny, you know, and I was dizzy. I could barely could make it to the toilet, <laughs> pretty much. 
had to go to, to the doctors and said, you're fine. You know, my keyboard player, Per, said that, uh, well, you have a, it's a depression or like an anxiety attack or something. And he lent me a book on that type of stuff. And I read a little bit, it's like, yeah, it seems like <laughs> that's how it is. Which was, in its own, was kind of nice to, to know what it, what it was, you know. And then I gradually got back, got it back together. But that was uh, the most difficult times in my life. I was questioning everything, what I was doing, the band, everything. And I didn't want to do anything anymore. One of the most recent highs for us was the Albert Hall show. But that was definitely one of the big things in, in my career. Uh, as, a, as a musician myself and for the band, definitely. It's the, possibly one of the bigger solo shows we've done. It was just amazing, beautiful. But there's many, you know, like every um, new album is a, is a high. Because for me it feels just uh, impossible after a recording session that we're ever going to be in that position again where we're recording a, a new album. I feel proud of what we have achieved in you know, these uh, 20 years and there's no reason for me to stop now.